and yeah, I just realized I was drinking from a Yale cup. Oh, <laughs> it, it, it's actually invisible against your virtual background. Yeah, I realize that. Let's see, maybe if I hold it up to my face. Wow, it's actually pretty pretty good at blocking that out. <laughs> sure, it's uh, a Yelp cup, though. I believe you. <laughs> no, no, this is back from the time when you know everybody was giving out free cups when you when you went to give a seminar. There was such a time. No, there was a time. <clears throat> Let's see. Maybe we we'll wait just one more minute before. Yeah, uh, whenever whenever you want. Um, There's not too much background noise. There's some bells ringing. I don't hear them here. <clears throat> All right. So maybe maybe I'll fire up here. So um, so welcome everyone once again to the Western. Hemisphere Colloquium in Geometry and Physics. Um, so the format uh, is it's a 60 minute talk followed by about 15 minutes uh, or so for questions. Um, so if you have a question during the main 60 minutes, uh, please uh, just type it into the chat, send to everyone, and I'll aggregate those questions and feed them onto the speaker. Um, uh, or at the end of the talk, we'll have a usual question session where you can just ask your questions out loud. Um, so Today, we're, uh, uh, we're very happy to have Thomas Dimitrescu from UCLA, who will tell us about two-group global symmetry in quantum field theory. OK, thanks, Andy, for the invitation and for the introduction. So it's uh, very nice to be here. Um, and um, I'll, I'll tell you about two-group global symmetry in, in quantum field theory in some particularly simple contexts. Um, I thought that because this is a colloquium with a fairly broad audience, uh, I will try to spend the first part of the talk giving a sort of a broad brush introduction to the subject um, based mostly on this first paper here, um, which contains lots of elementary examples. And then if there's time in, at the end, I will mention some more recent applications uh, that, that came out in the form of this paper. Both of these are in collaboration with uh, Clay Cordova and Canon Trelegator. Um, so let me start very, very, slowly, uh, some basics about symmetry and quantum field theory. And for the purposes of this talk, essentially all symmetries will be continuous and there'll be currents associated with them. So for example, a familiar example of a flavor symmetry in quantum field theory is a, is a abelian U1 flavor symmetry like baryon number and QCD. And it comes with an associated Noether current, J mu, that satisfies an operator conservation equation like that. And uh, I'm gonna follow the now common convention that uh, uh, this kind of gadget is to be called an, an ordinary or a zero form global symmetry. Um, and uh, I'm gonna put a little superscript zero on the U1 to remind you of that. So, so the superscripts in this talk will always be a reminder of the form degree of various objects. For instance, the, uh, the conserved current is a one form, J superscript one, uh, that's the one form current associated with this symmetry and the operator conservation law that it satisfies uh, can be written like this in form notation. Um, and once uh, such a conserved current has been found, it's possible to define charges by integrating it. Um, so in the first part of the talk, I'll be in four dimensions. I'll talk about four dimensional QFT. And for the most part, I'll take space time to simply be flat R4, although we can certainly consider more general space times as well. Uh, so we can define charges by integrating the conserved current over three cycles. And so uh, these are co-dimension one cycles in four dimensions and they define topological operators Q of sigma three. Uh, they're topological in the sense that the conservation of the current J allows us to deform the shape of the surface sigma three without changing the value of the charge, as long as those changes don't cross any other insertions. Okay. And in this language, the objects that are charged under such a conventional global symmetry, which are simply the local operators, here's one, O of X, are, are exactly the things that can be topologically linked by this charge surface in 
Euclidean R4, for instance. So here, here I have a, a, such a surface linking a point in R4. And uh, if I apply that charged surface to such a local operator, for instance, by shrinking that surface down to encircle the operator, then it evaluates the U1 charge of this operator O of X. Um, so, so in this language, the, uh, the role of the conserved charges are played by these topological operators. Uh, now, if you act with a local operator like O of X on the vacuum, then it's often possible to create point particles. And when you do that, those point particles will carry uh, U1 charge. In the remainder of the talk, I'll need one more layer of <clears throat> machinery for, for discussing global symmetries in quantum field theory. And this is totally standard for global symmetries. Uh, and that is I'll need to couple my current J1 to a non-dynamical background field, to a classical source um, for that operator. And so I add to the action of the theory uh, a standard um, coupling like this that couples the dynamical current operator to a, a non-dynamical C number gauge field, big A. Uh, and here I've written it for you in, in form notation. So A1 is the, the one form background field coupling to the current. Okay. Now it's a standard fact that we'll see a few times that current conservation at the level of this operator equation is in one-to-one -one correspondence suitably understood uh, to the invariance of the partition function of the theory in the presence of the background field A under background gauge transformations of A. So if I modify the background field by something that looks like an ordinary one form gauge transformation with zero form gauge parameter little lambda here, uh, then the partition function is invariant uh, uh, after you know, decorating it with suitable counter terms and things like that. Um, so that, that means that the background field A is really a background gauge field. It's a U1 zero background connection associated with the global symmetry. Uh, and uh, the reason I'm starting with this very basic uh, reminder is because this is the language that has been used to recently generalize this familiar story in a variety of important ways. Uh, and perhaps the most well-known generalization is, is that from ordinary or zero form symmetries to higher form symmetries, um, initially called generalized global symmetries, but now we have further generalizations yet, so I'll stick to higher form symmetries, um, introduced and, and clarified by these groups of authors. And there are many beautiful examples of, of that phenomenon, but I'll stick to the a very, very simple one in four dimensions. Um, I'll stick to continuous U1 one form symmetries uh, in four dimensions, and because they are continuous, they can also be phrased in terms of a conserved current, except that now the current is a two form. It's a higher form conserved current. So I have a, a two form that satisfies this conservation equation. And if you want it written out in indices, here it is, J is a two form. So it's an anti-symmetric tensor and it satisfies an ordinary conservation equation like that. And set up in this way, everything that you said about the Ordinary zero form case applies almost without modification to this two form or higher form case. So for example, we can define topological surface operators by integrating star J over a cycle of appropriate dimension. And here it's going to be a two cycle or co-dimension two cycle inside four dimensions. So these are uh, these Q of sigma twos are topological surface operators um, associated with the one form symmetry. Now, just like the topological co-dimension one operators associated with ordinary symmetries link local operators, these topological surface operators also link charged objects, but the appropriate linking is co-dimension two and therefore the, the linked objects are lines. The charged objects are lines. Uh, one intuitive way of thinking about this is to take the line defect that is charged under the, the symmetry of interest and place it along time. Uh, and then it resides at a point in space. And the, uh, the uh, topological surface sigma two links the line inside R4, or equivalently, if you focus on a constant time slice in R3, it surrounds the point in 
uh, Euclidean R3 uh, and evaluates, roughly speaking, some kind of flux around that point. And indeed, in the simplest examples that I'll stick to, uh, these one form symmetries will be associated with gauge fluxes. Okay, and just like the local operators could create states, particle states that were charged under ordinary symmetries, the line operators can act on the vacuum to create dynamical states that are charged under the one form symmetry. And at least in certain phases, those states are charged strings. So the simplest example of this story, which is what I'm going to focus on for a little while now, um, is four-dimensional Maxwell theory, both free and interacting. Um, in the free theory, we have a single dynamical U1 connection and its field strength, little f. Little a and little f are, are the dynamical Maxwell fields. And um, little f satisfies both the Bianchi identity as a result of being locally exact, and it satisfies the free Maxwell equation of motion. So in free Maxwell theory, there are two different one form symmetries associated with these two closed two forms. And uh, they're gonna be of roughly speaking electric and magnetic type. So the U1 electric is going to uh, come about if you take the two form current to be proportional to F and then the conserved charges obtained by integrating star of the current over this surface sigma two is just the electric charge, the standard Gaussian electric flux integral for the electric charge that you um, get by integrating star of F or the electric field over the two cycle. And the magnetic version of this symmetry, which is another different symmetry, uh, is obtained by integrating the magnetic flux F over sigma two. So this defines the electric and magnetic topological charge surfaces in free Maxwell theory. And as you might imagine, the appropriate charged line defects in this context are line defects that carry those electric and magnetic charges. So there are electrically charged Wilson lines that can, can carry any charge and there are magnetically charged the Toft lines. Um, and of course you can also have dionic lines that are charged under both of these symmetries. So this is the higher form version, the, the, the one form version of, um, of a general higher form global symmetry. And the last step I want to remind you of in analogy with what we did for the zero form case is to couple these two form currents to background fields. And here the background fields will also be higher form gauge fields because JE and JM are two forms. The background fields will also be two forms, B fields like, like in string theory. So the coupling of J electric to its B field looks like that. And the coupling of J magnetic to its uh, B field looks like that. And in particular, I want you to draw your attention to the fact that if you express J magnetic in terms of the Maxwell field, the stars go away and you get a coupling that just looks like B magnetic wedge, the Maxwell field strength, which is a standard BF type interaction or a standard green Schwartz type coupling involving the non-dynamical B field and the dynamical U1 Maxwell field, okay? And just as in the ordinary symmetry case, um, current conservation of J electric and J magnetic or the Maxwell equations and the Bianchi identity mean that you can do one form background gauge transformations of B electric and B magnetic. So you can shift them like this by D of arbitrary one form gauge parameters subject to suitable global conditions uh, and the partition function in the presence of the B fields will be invariant. So this, this is the beginning of a, of a rich and beautiful story, which has its most interesting incarnations in non-abelian gauge theories and beyond. Uh, and there are many, many recent results on that. And I will not review any of them here. Uh, the, the main point I want to drive home before moving on to the class of symmetries that I want to discuss is that symmetries are key in analyzing quantum field theories and especially important at strong coupling. Uh, and so more symmetries are better and new kinds of symmetries are also better. So we want to understand 
global symmetries in whatever their most general and useful incarnation is. Uh, th this, of course, is not um, an original thought. So what I want to focus on in this talk is yet a further generalization of global symmetry beyond higher form global symmetry to what is called a higher group symmetry or an N group symmetry. In the simplest case, which is the one I'll talk about, is, is called a two group. And before I get to explaining what that means, at least in, in my examples, uh, the basic intuition that I want to sort of impart about this is that in many interesting examples, um, the ordinary zero form symmetries that a theory may, might have and the higher form generalized symmetries often do not talk to each other. They kind of live in separate, uh, you know, uh, sectors of the theory and and you know you can analyze them separately and each of them tells you something interesting about the theory but they're not fused together in a kind of inseparable way and higher group global symmetries of the type that i'm going to introduce you to um arise precisely when this kind of interconnectedness happens at a at a much more um, dramatic level so the example that i want to spend a little bit of time on uh, inter uh, and use to to introduce you to this concept is uh, four-dimensional QED. So almost a textbook level example. It's not quite QED. It's uh, it's QED with more than one flavor uh, of electron. So we're going to discuss QED with generalized to n massless flavors, and by that I mean uh, we, we start with U1 Maxwell gauge theory, and we're going to couple it to NF. Dirac electrons of charge one and mass zero. So I'm going to have NF different copies of the electron. And here it's written in Dirac notation. Here it's written in two component vial spinner notation. And I have NF of them. And I'm, I'm going to go through with you a, a, what seems like an elementary exercise, which is to look at the well known classical symmetries of this problem and then there are anomalies, uh, and, and then we'll learn something amusing. So classically, uh, this system has three different kinds of very well-known global symmetries. Of course, it has the gauge symmetry. Sorry, I shouldn't call that a global symmetry. It has the gauge symmetry under which the electrons all have charge one. So if I, if I write this in vial spinner notation for psi and for chi, chi being the uh, co complex conjugate of the chi bar that appears here, these have electric charge one and minus one um, as in norm ordinary QED. There's also a classical axial symmetry under which both of them have charge plus one. As I'm sure you know, the symmetry is anomalous and I'll, I'll say a few words about that in a second. Uh, and then because we've generalized from one electron to n, n electrons, there are interesting chiral non-abelian flavor symmetries. There's an SUN left chiral flavor symmetries that only acts on the psi's, on the I index of the psi's, but not on the chi's. And then there's an SUNF right that only acts on the chi's, but not the psi's. So in total, this interesting symmetry, it looks like SUNF left times SUNF right. So we have a, 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 an interesting large global symmetry to play with. And I should also make a comment about the one form symmetry of this um, model. The free Maxwell theory we said had both an electric and a magnetic one form symmetry associated with its uh, two closed two forms. But once you couple that free Maxwell field to charged matter, only the magnetic symmetry remains. The magnetic symmetry remains because the Bianchi identity is still holds in QED. So you still have a closed uh, two form field strength. But the uh, electric version of the symmetry gets destroyed because the Maxwell equation now has an inhomogeneous right-hand side. So, so d star f is proportional to the electric current of the electrons, and that's not zero. And since the electrons have charge one, um, the symmetry is broken completely. So there's no, no interesting remnant of it here. So, to discover the fate of the remaining symmetries, uh, it turns out to be instructive and necessary to examine their perturbative anomalies. 
In other words, the, the standard triangle anomalies in the theory captured by their anomaly polynomial. And at this point, it might not be entirely obvious uh, why I need to go through this exercise to truly understand what the global symmetries are. After all, anomalies are anomalies, and they sort of come logically after the symmetries. But uh, you'll see that, I, that there's an important point that, um, that I want to make. OK, so the standard perturbative anomalies in QED calculated via very old-fashioned fermion triangle diagrams uh, can be captured by a six-form anomaly polynomial. And I'm going to discuss four different terms in this anomaly polynomial, which I'll call I gauge, I ABJ, I global, and I mixed. And roughly speaking, these four terms correspond to all the different ways of putting either dynamical or background gauge fields at the external vertices of the anomalous triangle. And each of them is interesting, and each of them has a totally different physical interpretation. Uh, almost all of them are textbook level standard. OK, so the gauge anomaly, the first one we're going to start with, it comes from a triangle diagram with only external photons. And uh, in principle, such a, a term in the anomaly polynomial is proportional to something built only out of the dynamical Maxwell gauge field. So it's proportional to C1 cubed of the Maxwell field strength with some anomaly coefficient k gauge. But of course, this anomaly coefficient cancels in QED. Right? The, the electron and the positron make equal and opposite contributions to this diagram, and the gauge anomaly cancels. The, the theory is vector-like as far as gauge quantum numbers are concerned. And of course, this is required for the consistency of QED as a gauge theory. So this is not even up for debate. This is just a reminder. The second equally famous diagram is the ABJ diagram, which consists of a triangle where two of the external legs are photons and the third leg is occupied by a current. In this case, it has to be an abelian current and, and the only abelian current in this model is the axial symmetry current, JA. So this anomaly is proportional at the level of the anomaly polynomial to one insertion of the axial background gauge field, the background gauge field associated to the axial symmetry, and two insertions of the dynamical Maxwell field. Right. And these three insertions, global gauge gauge, correspond to the global gauge gauge vertices of the triangle. OK, very good. So this, this diagram is the famous adler bell jakeef or ABJ axial anomaly diagram, and it does not vanish in QED. Because right? psi and chi have equal axial charge, but opposite gauge charge. The opposite gauge charge here doesn't matter because it appears in a square because there are two, two photon vertices. So, so these two loops from the psi and the chi fermion add, and we get a non-zero anomaly coefficient. Uh, and the upshot, very well known, is that the right-hand side of the conservation equation for the axial current is a, a non-zero operator. It's this non-zero anomaly coefficient times the operator f wedge f, and therefore it doesn't vanish uh, in flat space, it's not a conserved current anymore. And since I'm going to be essentially exclusively interested in conserved currents um, associated with genuine symmetries, uh, I'm going to discard the axial symmetry from the remainder of this discussion. So this 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 anomaly diagram is what convinces us that, at the very least, the axial current is not conserved. Um, So, so this kind of anomaly is the canonical type of anomaly that destroys a classical symmetry. OK. There's a third type of, of famous anomaly, which, which is interesting, but does not destroy a global symmetry. Uh, instead, it reveals interesting information about that symmetry. And that's the anomaly that consists of only background fields in the anomaly polynomial. So here, in my specific QED example, the anomaly polynomial is a six form. And I have two interesting SUNF global symmetries. There's the SUNF left and the SUNF right that act separately on the electron and the positron. Um, and they can appear in this anomaly polynomial via their third term class um, or 
in physics parlance because SUN admits a non-trivial totally symmetric D symbol. Um, and so here, here I have a right-hand side that only consists of background fields and correspondingly my fermion triangle diagram only has global symmetry currents on the external vertices. For example, this part of the anomaly polynomial comes from a diagram with three different um, SUNF left currents at the vertices. And there's a similar diagram for the SUNF right. So famously, these kind of anomalies give rise to a Tuft anomalies for the global symmetries, both for the SUNF left and the SUNF right. The diagonal SUNF is anomaly free, as you can see from this relative minus sign. And a key fact about the Tuft anomalies, one of the things that makes them so useful is that they in fact do not break global symmetries. So the currents are conserved as operators. They continue to be conserved as operators. They continue to satisfy these operatorial conservation equations inside correlation functions, as long as all the operators are at separated points. But instead they show up as, as, as subtle C number violations of this equation precisely at coincident points. So there's a small interesting bit of C number violation of this conservation equation by delta function contact terms, and that encodes these uh, non-trivial terms in the anomaly polynomial. Alternatively, a standard way of saying this is that if you couple the theory to background fields for SUN left and SUN right, then the partition function is almost invariant under background SUNF left and SUNF right gate transformations, except for an overall C number phase that, that carries the information about the anomaly. And of course, anomalies are incredibly interesting and useful data about uh, field theories, primarily because they satisfy matching. Um, but that's not where I'm going with this. The, the primary point I want to make is that that the Tuft anomalies by, uh, by themselves do not break uh, global symmetries. In other words, they don't they don't turn a an apparently conserved current into a non-conserved current at the level of operator equation. Okay, so with these preparatory examples out of the way, I want to discuss the, the hero of the story. Um, the hero of the story is what I call I6 mixed. And it's called I6 mixed because on its right-hand side, you will find both background fields for the SUNF left and SUN right um, flavor symmetries in the, in the form of their second churn classes. So these, these are two forms but I have to wedge with some other two form to get a six form anomaly polynomial. And here the uh, two form I'm wedging with is the dynamical U1 Maxwell field, the first turn class of the dynamical U1 Maxwell field. So I have an anomaly whose right hand side contains both global and dynamical gauge fields. That was also true of the ABJ anomaly where a, a global symmetry ended up being badly broken, but here it'll be slightly different. And the reason it's slightly different is because here we have only one vertex in the triangle diagram that, that is occupied by a dynamical photon corresponding to the single insertion of C1 of F. And we have two vertices that are occupied by global symmetry currents corresponding to these C2s here. And roughly speaking for this reason th that there's only one um, photon rather than two, this diagram neither destroys gauge invariance, for example, like the diagram with all photons did, nor does it destroy the global symmetry like the ABJ anomaly did uh, via the, the diagram we discussed before that had two photons on its external legs. So, so this diagram does neither of those dramatic things. Uh, it does something slightly less dramatic that is however still interesting. And the interesting effect of this diagram is that it leads to the following non-conservation equation for the SUNF left and SUNF right currents in the presence of background fields for these SUNF symmetries. Right? And the non-conservation equation can be read off from the, the from the triangle diagram or from the anomaly polynomial by descent. And it looks like this. So the divergence of either the J left current or the J right current uh, I guess I should have, strictly speaking, used the covariant divergence here, uh, is proportional to 
some six form on the right hand side sorry some uh, four form on the right hand side uh, there's a plus or minus dictated by the anomaly coefficient here um, and the right hand side is the wedge product of the dynamical c1 of f for the for the u1 gauge field which is an operator it's proportional to star of the magnetic current that is still a conserved current of this model and we have a term multiplying that that is roughly speaking well it's da of the of the sunf left or sunf right um, field strength it's not quite the the field strength so we have we have here on the right hand side a c number wedge and operator and by contrast, in the case of the ABJ anomaly, we had only operators on the right-hand side, no C numbers. And that's the big difference between these two cases. And the reason is that the moment you set the background fields to zero, right, this right-hand side just vanishes and the operators are still conserved at separated points. This exercise of setting the background fields to zero uh, essentially restricts you to saying things about separated points. And the fact that the right-hand side vanishes means that the SU2, SUNF left and SUNF right currents are still conserved at that level. So they're still conserved currents at the operator level. Um, what this right-hand side implies through the presence of this term proportional to a C number is instead a, a higher deformation, a sort of second order deformation of the current algebra of these currents. So it doesn't, it doesn't mess with their conservation law, but it instead messes with their current algebra. And the easiest way to see that is to start with this equation and to turn it into an equation that doesn't involve background fields by taking a derivative with respect to this source. That has the effect of inserting on the left-hand side another copy of the current so that we get the divergence of one current and another current. And it turns the right-hand side, turns the C number piece of the right-hand side into a derivative of a delta function times the dynamical operator piece that comes along for the right. So we get an equation like this. Um, this equation is perhaps not super familiar, although it looks a little bit like um, certain two-dimensional anomaly equations. Uh, but it can be made more intuitive by integrating this equation to get rid of the derivative out front. And if you do that, you discover that this particular um, contact term in the fusion of the divergence of J with another J actually uplifts to a non-trivial singular term in the OPE of one J with the other. And it's a singular term in the OPE. So it's, it's like a standard current algebra type object uh that that we're used to studying so in particular the the fusion of two j lefts at different points in, includes the uh two form current the magnetic two form current suppressed by some appropriate singular power of x minus y and similarly the 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 two j rights also fuse to the magnetic two form currents suppressed by the same power of x minus y and the coefficients here which i've sort of schematically written as one and minus one are precisely the anomaly coefficients that appear up here. So this is a non-trivial fusion algebra of two one-form currents into a two-form current dictated by these mixed gauge global anomaly coefficients. And this fusion of two one-form currents into a two-form current is, at least for the purposes of this talk, the defining feature of Two group symmetry, two, two group global symmetry. We have two kinds of global currents. One is an ordinary one form current for a zero form symmetry. One is a higher form current for a one form symmetry. I said in the beginning that often these things don't talk to each other, but here we have a situation where they are forced to mix. And this is the OP that controls the mixing. Okay.
Now, um, let me um, let me rephrase this story a little bit using background fields, as we've done already for the ordinary case and for the higher form case, um, because this will make this story a little bit more recognizable in some way. Um, so just as we did before, we're going to couple our zero form symmetry currents to uh, one form background fields, a sub left and a sub right. We've already used these in the anomaly polynomial. And we have now one magnetic one form symmetry uh, that has a two form current like this that we can couple to a magnetic source, which is the magnetic B field. And this is precisely the term that I reminded you before, it looks a little bit like a BF term or like a Green Schwartz term. So ordinarily, and as I reviewed, the uh, standard background gauge transformations for those fields would look like this. A would transform by the covariant D of a zero form gauge parameter for these left and right symmetries. And the B field would shift by D of a one form gauge parameter. And they wouldn't talk to each other. It would be kind of completely factorized. The, as you might imagine, the mixing between zero and one form symmetries that, that I've described to you include, induces some sort of mixing at the level of the background fields. And it's easy to figure out what it is. Let me first write it down. Um, so what happens in the presence of this two group modification of the current algebra is that the transformation rule of the magnetic B field acquires an extra term which I've written here in red. And the extra term is only activated under ordinary zero form background gauge transformation. So background gauge transformations associated with the ordinary global symmetries. These are the ones parameterized by these zero form gauge parameters, lambda L zero and lambda R zero. And, uh, and this is the form of the shift. And you see that the kind of shift you get here at the level of B is precisely the kind of shift that you're familiar with from the Green-Schwartz mechanism in string theory. In other words, we get a shift of a B field with something that essentially looks like the field strength of an ordinary gauge field, decorated with the gauge parameter and also with some interesting coefficients here that are dictated by whatever anomaly is being canceled. So, in the case of the Green-Schwartz mechanism, the anomaly that's typically canceled is some kind of gauge anomaly. And we can ask what kind of anomaly is being canceled here. Uh, well, roughly speaking, it's the it's, it's mixed gauge global anomaly that induces the two group mixing of the zero form and higher form symmetries. And the way to see that is to remember that the uh, conservation equation for the ordinary currents, the one form currents looks like this, in the presence of the two group, the presence of this mixed anomaly. So, so the divergence of the one form currents in, in, include on the right hand side, both the dynamical field F and some extra background fields for the left and right SU2 and F symmetries. And when you plug that into this term uh, under, under the action of such a gauge transformation, you see that there's a piece that doesn't cancel if you only do such a gauge transformation. And that piece is proportional to some C number object times the dynamical F. Okay, And that leftover piece needs to be dealt with if you want to turn this transformation into something that deserves to be called a symmetry, it needs to be canceled by something. And it's canceled precisely by modifying the transformation of B because B is the source for F. So any mistake you make, any transformation of the action, which spits out something proportional to F, can be turned into a symmetry by appropriately modifying the transformations of B. And that's what's happening here. So the words and the outcome are nearly identical to what you would say in the ordinary green sports mechanism, except that the interpretation is a little bit different because the objects we're dealing with here are global symmetries and background fields. Um, and the idea that two group global symmetry in the way I've described it to you is, is tantamount to the Green-Schwartz mechanism for background fields was emphasized 
early on by Kapustin and collaborators. Okay, so we've seen in a very simple example that anomalies of the type that I called I mixed, in other words, anomalies involving one abelian gauge field and two global symmetries inevitably give rise to two group global symmetries in four dimensions. And there are many other fun examples you can play with in four dimensions, other kinds of symmetries that can participate in the two group, um, flavor symmetries, Poincaré symmetries, all sorts of fun things you can do with that. But in four dimensions, the story I've told you is a little bit self-limiting because the dynamical gauge field that participates in this kind of I mixed anomaly is always a U1 gauge field, just by virtue of, of the fact that it has to you know, participate in a triangle diagram with only a single gate vertex. Um, and therefore it has to be a, a photon. It can't be a non-abelian gauge boson. Um, so in the remainder of the talk, what I'd like to do is, is to, you know, to the extent that there's time uh, is, is sketch some more recent applications of two group symmetry to 60 supersymmetric gauge theories that arise as effective descriptions of either little string theories or superconformal theories. And, and in six dimensions, these, these gauge theories will be non-abelian and they will nevertheless support non-trivial two groups. So maybe I'll pause a little bit to see if there are questions about the, the 4D part of the talk. Uh, there was one, but it's, uh, it's been answered. Excellent. So then I'll move on. Okay. Um, let me give you one, there are many effective gauge theories in 60 that I could write down for you that, that support two groups and there's a whole zoo to play with. But let me, let me write down one that everybody knows about and that also happens to have a nice embedding into a UV complete uh, theory in six dimensions. And uh, this, is, this is the maximally supersymmetric Young-Mills theory in six dimensions that arises in, in the deep IR of, of the, the maximally supersymmetric one, one little string theory. Uh, so this is the little string theory living on an NS5 brain stack in type 2b after you take the appropriate little string decoupling limit. So this is maximally supersymmetric in six dimensions. It has, it has one left-handed and one right-handed supercharge and the corresponding left and right-handed R symmetries from the transverse R4 of the NS5 brain stack in 10 dimensions. And at low energies, it flows to 60 uh, maximally supersymmetric Young-Mills with gauge group UN um, and, you know, I'll commit the usual atrocity of throwing the center of mass away and thinking about mostly the SUN part, um, which will be sufficient for the sort of local features of the theory that I'm describing. And the reason that non-abelian symmetries give you a whole different playground involving continuous one form symmetries and two group symmetries in six dimensions is that all non-abelian gauge symmetries in six dimensions have an interesting, automatically present interesting one form symmetry. And that's the one form symmetry associated with the instanton number. This is just automatically due to the fact that, that, that the instanton density in, four, in six dimensions is a four form and it's closed and therefore it's Hodge star defines a conserved two form current. So you, for free, get an interesting continuous one form symmetry, which I'll call U1 instanton. So this is sort of the, the 60 analog of the magnetic one form symmetry in 4D abelian theories, the thing that was a symmetry because of the Bianchi identity. This is also a symmetry because of the non-abelian Bianchi identity. And it's present in any 60 gauge theory, abelian or not. Uh, and the, the instantons of the low energy gauge theory that are charged under the symmetry are actually nothing but the, the little strings of the, um, of the little string theory. And uh, so the remnants of the type 2b strings after taking the decoupling limit. Now, I've explained to you in four dimensions that a suitable mixed gauge global anomaly diagram will inevitably give rise to two group symmetry. And I can go through the whole exercise again 
examining the different anomaly diagrams in six dimensions. Uh, but it won't surprise you to learn that a suitable mixed gauge global anomaly will again give rise to two group global symmetry in six dimensions, but now involving this instanton one form symmetry. And the reason all the form degrees get kind of augmented by two is because in six dimensions, the uh, anomaly polynomial is an eight form rather than a six form. Uh, it's computed by a box diagram fundamentally with four external legs rather than, than a triangle. Um, and therefore I can have an interesting mixed anomaly in six dimensions that involves uh, a background four form, like a C2 of either the SU2 left or SU2 right global R symmetry of this maximally supersymmetric Young-Mills theory. So these are background fields for that R symmetry. And then I still have room for another four form in my anomaly polynomial. And that can be the, uh, the instant on density of the dynamical SUN gauge field. So in other words, the, the star of the instant on two form current. So this is precisely the kind of structure that we explored in four dimensions that gave rise to two group symmetry. And the same thing is true here. So these, this kind of mixed gauge global anomaly inevitably induces two group symmetry. And you see that it's present in perhaps one of the most supersymmetric and symmetric six dimensional theories that, that we know. And unsurprisingly, it's present in many, many other less symmetric theories as well. And I guess I won't have time to say too much about this, but roughly speaking, this, this seems to be true in essentially all little string theories that we know of. Um, we checked it in a number of low energy gauge theory examples that come from little string theories. And uh, these authors wrote a nice paper uh, go going exhaustively through uh, many, many lists of little string theories constructed in F theory. Uh, and they showed that essentially all of them seem to have uh, microscopically this U1 one form symmetry. It's generically part of a two group and they computed what the two group kind of anomaly coefficient looks, looks like from string theory. And then they even matched this entire structure under the T duality transformations that relate different little string theories. So this is a, a new test, a new check if you wish of T duality in little string theories, but it's also a check that the two group symmetry that they carry is really uh, kind of a meaningful thing that characterizes the theory microscopically. It's not just some accident of the low energy gauge theory that I, that I was fooled by. Okay. So uh, in the last part of the talk, to the extent that there's time, I, I, I wanna sketch a little bit what you can learn, not about little string theories, but instead interacting superconformal field theories in six dimensions by thinking about them through the lens of two group symmetry. And uh, in order to do that, I'll have to remind you of a few features of these theories that, that are going to throw a little bit of a wrench into some of the, um, the 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 kind of gadgets that we've been discussing so far. And, and, that, and that's going to be important. So the story in, little, in, in, in SCFTs is going to be quite different than it is in, in little string theories. Um, the basic reason for that is that all SCFTs that we know of only support gauge fields on their tensor branch. So the tensor branch is a, is a part of the moduli space of vacua that is parametrized by scalars living in a tensor multiplet. Tensor multiplet has a dynamical self-dual two-form gauge field uh, which is the super partner of the modulus and there's also some fermion. And um, the B field that lives in this tensor multiplet inevitably has a dynamical green Schwartz coupling to the dynamical gauge field. So there's inevitably a coupling of the form dynamical B wedge dynamical C2 of F. No background fields here, this is completely dynamical and it's forced on you by anomaly cancellation, gauge anomaly cancellation. So this kind of term cannot be avoided in an SCFT. Unlike in a little string theory, for example, where we saw that you didn't have to have tensor multiplets at, at all at low energies. And this C2 of F of course is, is just the star of the instanton two form current that was 
happily participating in a two group before. So this Green-Schwartz coupling has all sorts of consequences. I think I've already mentioned one, which is that it has to actually cancel some gauge anomalies of the low energy theory, and therefore it has to be non-zero. Um, but there's another th kind of obvious thing that it does. If you, if you stare at this coupling between the instanton two-form current and this dynamical B field, which is that it gauges the instanton symmetry. Right? If you couple a two-form current like J instanton to a dynamical two-form gauge field, then you have gauged the symmetry. And that means it is no longer a global symmetry. So something has changed, okay? Something is quite different. This, this thing is sort of still sort of around as an interesting operator, but it's no longer to be viewed as, a, as the primary, you know, as a, as a, as a conformal primary, as a, as a symmetry current. Um, and that's good. Uh, the reason it's good is because you can prove a, a small lemma that says that unitary 6D SCFTs don't actually admit operators that have the quantum numbers of this J2 instanton. In other words, that are dimension four operators that are conserved two forms. So these operators violate the superconformal unitarity bounds in six dimensions, and therefore they're ruled out. Um, and, and therefore, on a priori grounds, unitary SCFTs in six dimensions support no conserved two-form currents, ergo no, con no continuous one-form symmetries, and a fortiori no two-group symmetries because the one-form symmetry needs to participate in such a two-group symmetry. So the whole structure that I've talked about is absent in SCFTs. So that's a that's a no-go result for, for SCFTs. Let me skip this point about the dilaton. Um, now, any questions about this before I move on? No, I think we're clear. Cool. Um, so the this no-go result stands on its own, but, but it can be pushed a little bit further to derive some interesting consequences for SCFTs. Um, and in order to understand those consequences, we have to remember that two groups sy symmetries were in one-to-one -one correspondence in the examples we discussed with the presence of certain mixed gauge global anomalies. So if the anomalies were non-zero, the two group was there. Now we have a different statement. We have the statement that the two, two group cannot be there in SCFTs on a priori grounds. And therefore we can turn it, this relationship around and conclude that certain anomalies, certain mixed gauge global anomalies have to vanish. And we can use that to derive new results about SCFTs. Um, so so let, me, let me sort of try to sketch that out. Um, we've already talked about the green Schwartz term on the tensor branch that looks like this. It's a, it involves the dynamical B field and the dynamical gauge field with some interesting coefficient that's fixed by gauge anomaly cancellation. But if the CFT has global, the SCFT has global symmetries, which it always does, it always has, for example, an SU2R symmetry or you know, it, it has Poincare symmetry, then you can also imagine coupling uh, in additional two forms here in the form of kind of green Schwartz terms for a dynamical B field and background fields. So for example, here I've indicated such a coupling involving the second term class of the SU2R symmetry with some anomaly coefficient K. And there could be other such terms involving say P1 of the tangent bundle or, or uh, term classes for flavor symmetries. So if these ter terms show up here, in addition to the, the pure operator term that, that we've already talked about, then they contribute non-trivially via the Green-Schwartz mechanism. Because the Green-Schwartz mechanism tells you that this term here gives rise to an eight form anomaly polynomial that's just the square of this whole expression here. The whole expression involving both dynamical and gauge fields. So if we square that, we get different kinds of terms. If we square this term, we get a pure gauge piece. If we square this term, we get a pure a Tuft anomaly involving only background fields. But if they're both present, we get cross terms. You get interesting cross terms. So here we get 
a cross term involving C2 of the dynamic gauge field, C2 of the R symmetry, for instance, with some combination of these anomaly coefficients, C and K. But now I'm going to repeat what I said before. Oops. Sorry. Now I'm going to repeat what I said before, which is that in the total anomaly polynomial, all mixed gauge global anomalies must vanish. Otherwise, if there's any left over, they would give rise to a two group. And we said that that's not allowed. So the, the way out of this conundrum is that this green Schwartz contribution to the mixed gauge global anomaly must in fact be canceled by other contributions to the same gauge global anomaly that come from low energy massless fields on the moduli space running in loop diagrams. So the standard fermion loop diagrams. In other words, the green Schwartz contribution to the mixed gauge global anomaly must cancel against the low energy contribution to that same mixed gauge global anomaly so that at the end, there's no two group, okay? And that is an interesting result because it means that you can calculate this coefficient and, or in other words, this coefficient here in the low energy effective action by only doing loop integrals involving massless fields on the tensor branch, on the moduli space. And that's something you weren't necessarily entitled to. This, this in general is some coefficient in the low energy effective action that as an effective field theorist, you don't know how to compute, right? It captures some effect of integrating out massive modes as you integrate out going from the, the UV CFT to the light description on the Coulomb branch, on the moduli space. Here, what we're learning is that in fact, this anomaly coefficient, even though it has this interpretation of being uh, the result of integrating out massive stuff, is completely fixed in terms of the massless particle spectrum on the tensor branch. And therefore it's computable in, in all examples. So it turns out that the procedure that I've just described to you was, uh, was proposed by these gentlemen a few years back as a kind of recipe for computing the Tuft anomalies of 60 SCFTs. Um, and what I've done for you ret retroactively is justify their recipe by appealing to the fact that 60 SCFTs do not have two group symmetry and therefore have to have this vanishing mixed gauge global anomaly. It was important, very important here that we're talking about a 60 SCFT, right? I've shown you an example of a very supersymmetric 60 theory that wasn't a CFT and that did have two group symmetry, right? The little string theory, the, the one one little string theory. So this was a special feature of 60 CFTs that came from superconformal unitarity bounds. Okay. So in the last few minutes of the talk, even though I'll probably not get through the whole, the whole discussion, I'll, I want to quickly sketch for you how we can use this machine for computing and controlling the Tuft anomalies of 60 SCFTs to make some progress on the 60A here. And I'll sort of sketch the main idea. And then if there are questions about it, I'm happy to explain in more detail. Um, in 60, the A theorem, as in other even dimensions, is a statement about the A-type conformal anomaly of the CFT. In other words, it's the conformal anomaly that appears in the anomalous trace of the stress tensor multiplying the Euler density in six dimensions. And the, the A theorem is the statement that this quantity decreases under RG flows. In other words, that the change in A between UV and IR is, is strictly positive. Uh, if you consider an RG flow interpolating between two CFTs. And the intuition for all this is supposed to be that A counts the effective number of degrees of freedom al along the RG flow. So th th these results are famously proven in two dimensions and in four dimensions, but in six dimensions, there's not yet a proof, certainly not without supersymmetry. And a few years back, also with Ken and Clay, we made some partial progress on this result for SUSY RG flows. Um, because SUSY RG flows are a little bit special in six dimensions. They all look like RG flows from the SCFT onto the moduli space. Um, and for this class of RG flows, we showed that the A anomaly 
uh, did in indeed decrease because, because the change in A was given by some quantity B squared where B was essentially some linear combination of green schwartz like coefficients like this K type coefficient that I just told you I could compute using the argument about the absence of two groups. So we showed that delta A has to be positive because it's a positive number squared, uh, but now we have complete control about actually being able to compute this number. And therefore we can say more about delta A than just that, that it's positive, we can actually control how big it is. Why is that interesting? Um, it's interesting because you might want to do better than simply proving that delta A is positive. You might also want to prove that the A anomaly of the actual SCFT in the UV is positive. That's certainly something that is expected as part of this general A theorem you know, lore if the interpretation in terms of degrees of freedom is supposed to hold up. Now, you might say this is kind of obvious because if the A theorem is, is true, then the A of the SCFT is, is simply delta A, which you already decided was positive, plus whatever the A anomaly of the infrared CFT is. And as long as the infrared CFT always has positive A, of course, it implies that the UV CFT ha always has positive A. But you see that you still have to input something about the infrared CFT, namely that it has positive A. And that's sometimes obviously true in examples and sometimes it's actually subtle. So the statement that A of the UV CFT is positive is, is um, strictly stronger than the statement that the A theorem holds, which is, which is just the statement that delta A is positive. Okay, and what you can do, um, using the machine I just described to you is make progress on this question because delta A itself becomes computable. Delta A has the same logic attached to it that B had before. Now, delta A is something that comes from integrating out massive degrees of freedom along the RG flow. So in principle, there's no reason why as a low energy theorist, you should know how big delta A is. By the time you get to low energies, you know that process has already happened. But because delta A is related to B, and B itself is some linear combination of these kind of Green-Schwartz type coefficients involving background fields on the tensor branch that have now become explicitly computable, you can actually compute how big delta A is. And if you, as a low energy theorist, you now control both A infrared, which is something you can compute at low energies, and delta A, which you weren't originally entitled to, but through the magic of supersymmetry and symmetries, uh, has become computable. So you can now explicitly compute both terms in this sum and check explicitly that A of the U UV SCFT is positive. So this proves that, that unitary 6D superconformal field theories have positive A anomaly. So I, I cut this discussion short a little bit because I think I'm, I'm over time, but I'm happy to say more about it if there are questions. So maybe I'll stop here. All right, uh, thank you. Let's thank the speaker. And uh, so now we have time for questions. Uh, so please, uh, please use the Zoom raise hand thing if you have a question. And I see actually we had a question from Nadi in the chat that we didn't get to. So maybe we can start with that. Uh, Nadi, do you just want to uh, unmute and ask your question? Uh, so you said that some anomalies must vanish. What exactly goes wrong if they don't vanish? Well, what goes wrong is if they don't vanish is that you, you um, for example, imagine you have a two group involving say the SU2R symmetry of the SCFT and, and some, some you know, low energy operator built out of the gauge field. So the instanton current, for example, of the low energy gauge field. Okay, what happens is that if you now do a background gauge transformation for the SU2R background gauge field, the path integral will spit out something involving a background field and this instanton operator. Explicitly. And what's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with it in general. No, but, but my question is, 
is this violation of conformal invariance? What, what is the input that you impose? The, the input is that the UV theory has no operators with the quantum numbers of this current. So when you do an SU2R symmetry transformation on the UV theory, it's impossible to get something proportional to this operator. Well, I, you, you put more input. It's, we, there's some super conformal field theory. We don't know where it came from. There's no UV or IR. There's some super conformal field theory. And you say that some anomaly must vanish. Something must vanish. What goes wrong? So when I say the anomaly must vanish, that's really a precise statement uh, in the low energy theory. The, the input I'm bringing from the superconformal theory, sorry, I, I should maybe clarify. When, when I say high energy and low energy, I mean the superconformal theory versus the theory in the moduli space. No, forget low energy. Just, let's just talk about the superconformal field theory. Okay. So you have a result that in the superconformal field theory, some amplitude vanishes. That's right. So, some operator, not some, not some, yeah, some operator, and therefore some, some particular transformation rules are disallowed. And if I find a theory which where it doesn't vanish, does it mean that I violated conformal invariance or supersymmetry or superconformal? What exactly did I violate? If you find any effective description where this kind of transformation arises, it means that whatever your parent theory was had to admit an operator, a non-trivial operator with the quantum numbers of this instanton current. Because that current was what appeared in this anomalous transformation rule. Okay. Okay. The, the statement I'm making about the superconformal theory is that unitarity bounds rule out the existence of such a parent operator. I see. So I might want to ask another question since I have the floor. Uh, and I've asked you that before. So in the context of ordinary truth anomalies, we know what they mean because it means that some defects will have some anomalous properties. And in most cases, so an example would be that a uh, some objects would be in a projective representation of the global symmetry. Mm -hmm. That would be one option. Here it's not an anomaly. So what would be the, the physical consequence of that? Is it property of dynamical defects or some interfaces where you have a, or some background fields that you can subject the theory to that appear in a funny representation? What, what exactly is the, the what would, would be the lowbrow way of saying that there's a two-group symmetry. Okay, so I, 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 let me try to give maybe one or two different answers and, and see if you if you like them. So I think one low lowbrow way, which I find very appealing, and since you asked about background fields explicitly, is the interpretation in terms of the the green Schwartz shift of B uh, that that I explained in the very beginning in the four-dimensional example. In other words, I have quantum field theory that I can couple to both A and B fields, and I'm forced to modify the transformation rule, rule of B in order to, to have the path integral be, be invariant. This, this, this transformation rule is forced on me. I have absolutely no choice if I want, to, if I want the path integral to be invariant under the uh, zero form background gauge transformations. If you want something that's more dynamical at the level of uh, uh, solitons or defects, th th there's the following thing I can point to, which I think is, is interesting, but, but I would say is, is the beginning of a not fully understood story. Are, are, are you okay with the, with the statement about background field? No, I understand the statement about background field, but okay. I would like something. Yeah, you want something else. So let me, let, me, let me give you something else. Let's go to this equation here. This is the non-conservation equation of the ordinary symmetry current uh, in the presence of its background field and, and the dynamical Maxwell field strength. Imagine you're in the Higgs phase. 
so that the magnetic symmetry is unbroken and there are Abrikozov strings that are charged under it. Okay, you, and we can even imagine that I've arran arranged the theory such that the bulk theory is completely gapped. For example, I can add Yukawa complings to add to, yeah, to gap, uh, get, yeah. gap the fermions. Then if I integrate this operator over the transverse two-dimensional space of the string, it picks up the magnetic flux. Okay, yes. so what this equation reduces to is a two-dimensional equation on the world sheet of the string and from the two-dimensional point of view, it looks like an ordinary Atuft anomaly. Because we now integrated out this operator part, picking up the string charge, and we're deducing the existence of a non-trivial Atuft anomaly on the string world sheet, which is completely controlled by the two-group coefficient, right, which appears here. And that's actually what happens. You can check yeah, that there- That's there's... exactly why I find it confusing, because I thought that what you had is in the end of the day, it's not an anomaly. It's a modification of the group. Right. So it's not, an anomaly in four, it's not an anomaly in four dimensions, but it can induce an anomaly on this string world sheet by inflow. Okay. So this statement appears as strong as an anomaly. It was supposed to be weaker than an anomaly. Um, it is weaker than an anomaly. For example, it does not guarantee that the bulk four-dimensional theory is gapless. I can engineer an RG flow, even in this QED example that we went through by just adding Higgs field that completely gaps the bulk, totally trivial, no you know, unique vacuum, nothing left over. But there are heavy strings, and the world sheets of the heavy strings carry anomalies. There's a separate story, which I didn't talk about at all, which is that two group symmetries themselves can ha have a Tuft anomalies. Right? Once you accept the, the dogma that these are new kinds of symmetries, they can have their own Tuft anomalies. So in other words, there can be non-trivial C number violations under the modified Green-Schwartz transformation laws of the B field and the A field then you can use those anomalies if they are present to deduce that the bulk theory is gapless nice. or at least non-trivial. But there are also examples where you just have the two group symmetry and it doesn't have an anomaly and then the bulk can be gapped. Nice. Thank you. We have another question from uh, Lisa Carbone. Oh hi. Um, my question is about the uh, the two group uh, structure that you um, that you introduced, and I'm wondering is it actually a group or is it some sort of fusion algebra? And do you how concretely do you see the fusion rules, if at all? Uh, well, let me try to give you something resembling the answer you might be looking for. Um, well, the most concrete version of the fusion algebra is, is this OPE, which if you are happy with, for example, 2D current algebras, is, looks very similar to, to, to a you know, two-dimensional Katsumuji algebras for, for non-abelian currents. Mm -hmm. So the, the only thing that's, that's amusing about this example is that the, the usual Katsumuji algebras would mix one-form currents with one-form currents. Here you mix one-form currents with two-form currents. Okay, thank you. That's, that's more or less exactly what I was trying to understand. Thank you. And more questions? I think we have time for maybe one more. All right, well, if not, let's uh, thank the speaker again. Thank you very much. Thank you. And our next talk will be in two weeks on the 22nd and the speaker is uh, David Benzby. So hope to see you all there. Thanks. Stop the recording.